Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. February 22nd, year of our Lord 2022. What do we got? A lot of two, 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 twos on there. <laughs> two, 22, 22. I think I got that right. The lesson is Matthew 428. 428. That's the message. I got that one wrong last time. Um, last message was 427, so we are on 428 messages into the Gospel of Matthew. Let me get settled in. Uh, today's title is Sorrow Grips Our Lord As The Cross Approaches. Sorrow Grips Our Lord As The Cross Approaches. I don't have any um, major announcements today, so I think I'm just going to jump right into it. There wasn't anything pending last night or this morning that I thought I needed to announce, so I think we're just going to jump right into the message because in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. In order to grow up, I tell you all the time, spiritual growth does not come unless you are in the new nature, walking in that Christ-like nature, which means you're filled with the Spirit, taking in the Word. Those are the things that are going to happen for us to grow up spiritually, we're going to see some things today about spiritual discernment, how important it is not being a baby believer. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10, clearly written, John wrote it to believers, speaking to believers. 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, sins you may have not known about or forgotten about. 1 John 1.10 says, Believers, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Let's take a moment of silent prayer right now. I just dropped my glasses. <laughs> There's plenty to pray for in the world. Let's take a moment of silent prayer right now and uh, let's wash the sin from our life. Get rid of the distraction and the garbage. Wash that sin. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Having that Christ-like nature, putting on his mind, his new nature and going forward studying the word communicating listening what the spirit is saying to the church every head is bowed every eye is closed and father we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word and father we just ask you to lift up those that have lifted this ministry up father we will ask you to touch all those positive believers across the world whether they're following this ministry or another doctrinal ministry, Father, that's teaching your grace and your truth and your love the accurate way, Father. Please touch them, lift them up, let them be the guiding lights, give them the strength to be the soldiers, the warriors, the ambassadors to go forward and be able to promote your word, Father. Lift it up amongst this lost and dying world. We're asking these things, we're asking for your healing hand with vaccines and viruses, Father, any division across the world. We're asking for our brothers and sisters in Christ that have stood up against tyranny in places like Australia and Canada recently, and they've dealt with almost a military fashion, uh, a fascist type of, of regime coming down upon them. Father, we're asking for your hand to go to them, protect them, give them the strength to go forward. We're asking all these things through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Speaking of our brothers and sisters out there, um, uh, Julie and I in Australia have been going back and forth with a couple of emails. Uh, she's doing good with her new dog. Her family is doing okay out there. Her daughters are doing okay. I had asked her to maybe, if she had the time, to edit the Angels book I want to get started on in a couple more weeks, once I get settled in. And I think she's a little bit busy, and right now it's probably going to maybe fall on somebody else. So I'm going to put it out there. If somebody has the time, if you don't have the time, I understand. Or if you don't feel it's your cup of tea... But if you want to be able to edit my, my book for the angels, I need to be able to start sending somebody some old notes. Once I organize them a little bit and I kind of make them a little bit nicer <laughs> so they fit into book form, I like to start sending them out to somebody, have somebody read through it, and just do some quick editing, correcting, and give me some suggestions without changing um, Pastor Rick. Uh, making of the book because it has to be my book obviously the spirit led me to teach those classes so I don't want somebody to come in and turn it into a whole nother thing but I need uh, an, uh, a basic editing and some suggestions 
before I uh, contact, finish this thing, and then eventually contact the book company and figure out uh, how and when we're going to print it. So it's a long process. Take a breath, relax, pray about it. Maybe you can help me in that area. Let's jump into it today. Sorrow grips our Lord as the cross approaches. We are in a study of the humanity of Christ. It is related to emotional responses. That's really what I want to focus on, that we all need to learn to acknowledge. We all need to learn to acknowledge our emotions. It's good to start understanding what your triggers are and things that you've struggled with in the past. You have to acknowledge your emotions, then understand them. Just because you acknowledge something doesn't mean you're totally understanding it. Once you acknowledge it and say, oh, I, 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 I acknowledge this area over here triggers me, or I acknowledge I have uh, impatience in this area, whatever it is you acknowledge, that's a good thing. But then you want to understand it, peel back the layers, and still be able to proceed forward uninterrupted by those emotions. Still be able to proceed forward uninterrupted by those emotions. So what you're doing is, for lack of a better phrase, is you're unpacking your emotions, who you are. You're starting to learn more about yourself. It's going to make you a better believer. That's what I really want to do in this series. Pick it back up in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, 37, we'll pick it up there and read through till about verse 40 or so, 40, 41, and we're going to tear into some principles today, looking at our Lord more and more, the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and how he dealt with emotional responses to things, and how we need to look at this and say, oh, I need to learn to do this like my Lord and Savior did in his humanity. That's what we're here for, folks. That's what we're here for, to be able to grow Move forward in grace and knowledge and be more Christ-like over time. Matthew 26, 37. And he, Jesus, took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him and began to be grieved and distressed. We started looking at this. He's having an emotional response. Matthew 26, 38. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. So we now have begun to really peel back some layers on the humanity of Christ. That's really what I want to do in this series. Peel back some of the layers on the humanity of Christ and put our own emotional responses to things next to our Lord in different situations. And you're going to see what I'm talking about today, I believe. So we're seeing that Jesus within his thought patterns is contemplating all the events leading up to this moment. And then the cross just ahead is on his mind. So there's a buildup of a lot of things, and the cross is right there. He can see it. He can almost touch it. It's right there. He knows it's only hours ahead. There's a sense of deep grief. We would say deep grief, excuse me, and almost overwhelming sorrow. That's the best way I can describe it, because in the original Greek, it talks about something very heavy on him, and it starts to be heavy even physically for him. So it's deep grief, but it's an overwhelming sorrow that has pressed upon him. And notice, it's not fear. Notice it's not fear. Uh, that's an important principle. It's not fear. Do you fall into fear every once in a while? Listen, we're human, we're flawed creatures, yes. But I'm telling you, the Lord didn't have fear. That wasn't an issue of fear. Yet it's a heaviness that almost resembles depression. Almost. It is becoming so strong that his physical system is being pushed to an extreme limit. It's pushing on his physical system. Listen, I had something happen the other day. You can see it's kind of purple and red, top of my thumb. Tiny little cut, very deep. Do you know I almost passed out the other morning? Yes, Sunday morning. I made an omelet after I did the message in the early afternoon. And the wife and I, she's doing stuff. I finished the message. And I'm trying to make an omelet and do two or three things at once, which I shouldn't have been. I was uploading a message, doing this, cutting some pieces of tomatoes with a super sharp knife. Need I say more? Um, and it's a tiny cut, but it was right at the top of the nerve center where your fingertips, very dangerous place actually. And of course, you, when your blood pumps and your heart's going and you cut a real bad nerve like that, it, it causes you to feel almost uh, vomitous, almost sick, nauseous. I got dizzy and spinning. I went and sat on the couch. My, I felt myself go white. My wife, luckily, she used to be a CNA for a lot of years. She came over and dealt with it, but she said, you're passing out. I said, you got to be kidding me. She goes, no, you are. And I can tell you, my knees buckled. A little thing like that, your body being pushed, but you'd be surprised on the end of your fingertips, especially your thumb like that, 
is a nerve. You cut the top of that and let that go, it is going to go, not to be gross, start squirting everywhere. We were able to seal it off without me having to go to the hospital or nothing because it's tiny, but it's super deep, super sharp knife, brand new. You don't want to know. So I, the room started spinning. I literally stumbled across the room holding my hand, my thumb, and go, sat on the couch before I fell down. I just, a wave came over me. Extreme physical is heaviness. Extreme physical pressure came upon the Lord. I can relate. I was trying to relate that to this message when I thought about it. How these things happen and the whole moment of the situation and then your body responds when there's pain. And we're going to be looking at that when he goes to the cross. But you'd be surprised how something even small in your life can bring all of a sudden a physical response from the mental actions and the different things going on around you where you actually feel you don't have as much control over your body as you thought you had. It's human, folks. That's human responses. Matthew 26, 39. Not to get sidetracked, but it made me think about today's message. Matthew 26, 39. And he, Jesus, went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, he, has not, he is not fearful, he's not afraid. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, not what I want, Father. Your will, your plan be done. I'm here to fulfill your plan, Father but I'm feeling overwhelmed that this can pass me by, Father. Please allow it to be or give me the strength to go forward in it, which is a normal prayer in an extreme circumstance. Matthew 26, 40, and he, Jesus, came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. So we know our Lord was praying for an hour and the bulk of his prayer may have been related to Matthew 26, 39. But you're going to notice something in this series as we tear this apart more and more. He does this one time, and it looks like he does a long prayer talking to his father about the plan of God and, and having the strength to get through it. And then you will see he lets it go and goes forward. So he comes to the disciples. They're sleeping, and he, they found him sleeping. He said to Peter, so you men could not even have kept watch for me for one hour? So we know he was praying and having fellowship with the father for almost an hour. Matthew 26, 41. Keep watching and praying, he tells them, so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We talked a lot about the human spirit that we're given at salvation, where we, we become trichotomous three, not dichotomous two anymore. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ fell on his face to pray, it tells us. Fell on his face. And the Greek verb there is pipto. To fall forward. Pipto, meaning to thrust yourself forward. This means to graphically prostrate yourself down upon the ground. I'm going to tell you, when I walked over to the couch the other day, the room was spinning and this rush went and chill went over me. And I'm trying to put something on top of my thumb. I just thrust myself on that couch. I can relate to this. I was putting the notes together. Uh, notes together chuckling at my own issue. Obviously, I'm nothing, and that's nothing compared to our Lord. But I just started thinking about the analogies in our body. He thrust himself, pipto, forward. It means graphically prostrate yourself down upon the ground. Like, just throw yourself flat on the ground. This was not only a show of respect for God the Father. It was a physical weight, this is what I'm telling you, that pressed Jesus downward. You ever heard the term, your knees buckle when you hear some bad news? or something happens, your knees start to buckle, the room spins a little bit. That's what we're talking about. That physical weight was from the deep sorrow that had finally caught up to him. He's only human. In his humanity, we're looking at Christ's humanity. Keep that in mind. Doctrine of the hypostatic union, 100% God, 100% man. Jesus is well aware of the gravity of this moment. What is to come is now really glaring in his face. He's not prepared to run from it. He's not prepared to run from it. That is not the issue. There was no fear. I can't stress that enough. He simply was displaying real human emotions in the face of a real strong adversity, a horrific event, a bunch of things piled up all at once, all around him, even the people he loved were being affected, and now he's looking ahead at this cross. This set of circumstances, this portion of the plan is where the heat would be turned up physically and spiritually. This set of circumstances he's finally in, this portion of the plan, everything building up to this, is where the heat 
would be finally turned up, we would say, to a very high level, physically and spiritually, for the humanity of Christ. Everyone, from, an from angels to mankind, would witness Jesus give himself over to the plan of God the Father fully, and everything unfold. This played out for everyone to see. A lot of pressure on Jesus Christ, the humanity. We often forget this temporal world we live in is not only the angelic battlefield, it is an open stage for everyone to see everything. There's an added pressure with that on anybody's humanity. Listen, just getting up in front of a camera and speaking and getting it right or talking in front of a crowd can, can really make some people almost pass out. And it gives you a lot of nervous energy. So there's pressure when if th something bad is going on and all these things are happening all around you, then on top of it, you realize you, everybody is witnessing what you're going through. I mean, everybody, angelic and human. So we often forget this temporal world is like a stage. It is an angelic battlefield and it's a stage. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 reminds us, therefore, since we also have so great a cloud of witnesses, angelic and human surrounding us, let's rid ourselves, believers, of every obstacle and the sin, believers, which so easily entangles us. Yes, you struggle with sin after salvation. And let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. How many times recently have I called you to action as a believer? Not be a couch potato Christian. Let's run a race. There's something you do after salvation that's set before us. Verse 2, more importantly here, looking only, our focus only at who? Jesus, the originator and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, all of us set before him, endured that cross, despising the shame. This is what I'm going to point out here. And has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice, endures and despising. Jesus wasn't looking forward in his humanity to this section of the plan of God, this portion of the plan of God. And the joy set before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is all of humanity. Certainly us, believers, we are the joy set before him. Really all of humanity. He willingly endured. He wasn't looking forward to it. Oh, goody, goody. My world's falling apart physically and mentally and spiritually. I'm under complete pressure. All my people I care about are going to be under pressure. And I'm going to this, this cross. He willingly endured the pain and the shame. Yet, in his humanity, he was not happy about this. This assault on his integrity and his body was a horrific event. Everything about our Lord is going to be tested. Even his integrity and uh, trying to make him completely humiliated and beaten down in front of the people, in front of angels, in front of everybody, and then hung on a cross. Because we know he's betrayed and he's lied about. That's, a, that's an assault on your integrity. When you're dragged through a court system, a justice system, for unjust reasons and lies and betrayal are happening, that's an attack on your integrity. He was hit from every angle. So he wasn't looking forward to this, but he endured it, as it says, endured it, and despised that shame, but he still went forward in the God's plan. 2 Corinthians 5.21. What does the Apostle Paul say? He made him, God the Father, part of his plan, made Jesus Christ, God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. It had to happen that way. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in our union with him. It would happen no other way. This was the divine standard. This is the call, this is the plan, this is the divine standard of justice for all mankind to be made pure, having that righteousness, so we can get through the divine courtroom of heaven. It had to be him, it had to be this way, no way around it. The divine justice system of God has set the standard in eternity past. The standard was already there. We are given a glimpse of that, or that law, that standard, whatever you want to say, because it's God's justice system in the very beginning of the Bible, but it was done in eternity past, but we see it throughout the Bible. Look at some of these early scriptures, Genesis 3.21, and the Lord God, after the man and woman failed, they sinned, they fell. What did he do? The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife to clothe them. He had to cover the sin issue. He had to take care of it with innocent blood. 
The standard was set in eternity past. We note it through several scriptures and several principles, obviously. God had to sacrifice an innocent animal to cover the sin of the original man and woman. That's what that tells us. The coming cross, the Messiah, he will be the sacrifice. But right there, even there's so many scriptures that, that point to the standard, the justice system, and only Christ could be the one to do it, the innocent lamb. This is the, where the standard we start seeing in Scripture. It actually even mentions it when the, um, when, the, when the original sin happened and God was dealing with the serpent, Satan. He said, listen, you're going to bruise him on the heel. That has to do with our Lord taking the punishment, that bruise on the heel. He'll smash your head, your venom, but you're going to bruise him on the heel. So we see it throughout Scripture. But this is God's divine justice system from eternity past. God doesn't change. He's not a judge that, eh, it's a, it's a new day, it's a new year, it's new this, it's new that. Let's change this law. Let's, let's twist this and turn this. And do. God is set. His standards are set. His standards are actually set in eternity past. We're just learning to live in them and understand them. This is why later, think about it, in the assembling of the Exodus generation, we see the Passover lamb in Egypt. We just did a study on that. What was the Passover lamb? Innocent, pure. Notice that. That's the standard. Pointing to who? Jesus Christ. It was the standard handed down from the original garden. It was decided or declared or set in stone in eternity past. Genesis 4, 3, again, early part of the Bible. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the ground Cain is using his own flesh, his own power. Look what I can do to add to salvation. Verse 4, Abel on his part also brought an offering from the firstborn of his flock and from their fat portions, and the Lord had regarded for Abel and his offering. In other words, the Lord looked at it, gave it to God, said, you did things the proper way. Cain was more of a farmer working the land, but if he would have humbled himself and went to his brother Abel and said, Abel, can you give me or find me another perfect one in your flock that I can bring for the sacrifice to the Lord? I want to do things God's way. He was too filled with pride and said, let me do things my way. Religion is like that. In fact, a lot of analogies in theology say Cain had his own idea about religion, how he was going to do things and have his own salvation, his own power. Abel brought the innocent, perfect sacrifice to the Lord. There's the standard. The firstborn animal. Not only that, but a perfect specimen and the best portion of the animal. That's why it says, where it says, what, the firstborn of the flock and the fat portions? That's related to the best portion, the purest, cleanest portion of the animal. The best portion. Abel understood the sin offering. Related to who? The coming Messiah. Abel understood it. Abel, the believer, Cain was not. Genesis 4, 5, and we see that, but for Cain and his offering, God had no regard for it. He would, not, he would not have that fellowship with him over that. He didn't recognize that. He had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his face was gloomy because Cain did not follow the protocol, the standard. Cain never adjusted to the justice system of God. The standard is set in the divine justice system. It was a perfect lamb of God, Jesus Christ. That's what they had to remember back then. Everything prior to the cross needed to point directly and exactly to him. The perfect one, Jesus Christ, the unique God-man of the universe. Jesus Christ, the lamb of God. Everything had to point to him. Cain would not. Cain would not adjust to the justice system of God. Jesus Speaking about drinking the cup, we see that, or having the cup pass him by. We note the Bible speaks about a cup in relation to the plan of God. We see it in several scriptures. I'm going to show you some. I'm going to show you how this all comes together, but you can't get away from God's divine justice system. The standard was already set in eternity past. We see it very early in the Bible. There's no question about it. Many times the cup, when Jesus is talking about the cup, the cup, the plan of God, what I have to drink, this cup of wrath coming upon me, is related to divine judgment. It's not uncommon. We see it throughout the Old Testament. Psalm 75, 8. 
For a cup is in the hand of the Lord, and the wine foams, it is well mixed, and he pours out of this, certainly all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink its dredge, dregs, excuse me. <laughs> but what you're looking at there, cup, we're going to see the analogies of the cup, what Jesus is talking about. This wasn't uncommon. This was a very common statement in the nation of Israel related to the Old Testament scriptures especially. And our Lord always was grabbing Old Testament to present to the Jews and saying, I am the Messiah, I am the one. I know all of the things you study. I know the exact reality of the shadows and the rituals you are doing. They are me. I am here to fulfill it. Isaiah 51, 17 says what? Pull yourself up, pull yourself up. Arise, Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of staggering you have drunk to the dregs. Jeremiah 25, 15, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says to me, take this cup of, look, cup of what? The wine of wrath from my hand. Almost always, not always, but almost always, we start to see the cup related to God's divine judgment somehow. And a lot of times it has to do with the wrath of his judgment, the, the point where debt needs to be paid, and give it to the nations to whom I send you to drink from it. Drinking from my wrath speaks to the judgment of God is now finally here. You gotta deal with the outcome. The gavel came down, now the sentence is coming out. The humanity of Christ is well aware of the coming judgment about to be thrust upon his body and soul. He knows this cup that's coming is incredibly horrific for him to deal with, but it has to be done in the exact way God the Father's plan was laid out in eternity past. It has to align itself perfectly in the justice system of God. So Jesus wasn't trying to run from it. He wasn't trying to knock the cup over and run away in fear. That's not what he did. The humanity of Christ, he's well aware of the coming judgment. It's about to be thrust upon him. Jesus is not running from it, nor is he overreacting. He's not running, nor is he overreacting. He is having a normal emotional response to the gravity of the historic moment. Let me say that again, and I want you to absorb that for your own spiritual walk. He is having a normal emotional response to the gravity of the historic moment. He's not running from it. He's not trying to knock it over and trying to say, hey, somebody else come over here and help me out. He's not doing any of that. And he's not fearful. That's not what's going on. There's a gravity of the moment and his emotions are responding. There's no fear. There's no attempt at hiding. You know, I want to hide. I want to get away from this within Jesus's behaviors. He's not having these sinful behaviors related to his emotions, but he is showing a response from his emotions. You know, I, I was looking at different ways to put this, and the great English preacher from the 1800s, Charles Spurgeon, many of you know him, may have said it best, and I'm not here to reinvent the wheel, that's not a pastor's job, so I was looking at this and saying, there's no better way to put this. And again, Charles Spurgeon writes, he chose the garden amongst other contiguous to Jerusalem, in other words, alongside next to Jerusalem, because Judas knew the place. Think about that. He wanted retirement, but he did not want a place where he could skulk and hide himself. He was, oh, poor me, poor me, let me hide out over here. He wasn't doing that. It was not for Christ to give himself up that were like a suicide. In other words, yes, let me just go kill myself. But it was not for him to withdraw and secrete himself that he were like a cowardice. Listen, look at how that reads. I'm going to leave it up there for a moment. This is, I know it's the old English. It's the way Charles Spurgeon, the guy was around in the 1800s. Great Baptist preacher, a lot of his writing and commentary, really nice to read. And it gives you, when you're studying the Bible, it gives you another angle to look at. And he's very eloquent how he puts it. So why reinvent the wheel? This is phenomenal. It's exactly what I'm talking about. And again, he, Jesus, chose the garden amongst other contiguous to Jerusalem because Judas knew the place. That's an important principle. He wanted retirement. In other words, I need to get away from all this stuff, get away from the work and the pressure. 
but he did not want a place where he could skulk, oh poor me, and hide himself. That's not what he was doing. He wasn't running. It wasn't about fear. It was not for Christ to give himself up that were like suicide. In other words, well, I'm just giving myself over and I'm just going to commit myself and kill myself. But it was not for him to withdraw and secrete himself that were like cowardice. This is a powerful, powerful statement. Again, you should really, really take a note on that. Jesus, here's how I look at it. Jesus was exactly where God the Father ordained him to be in that moment of history. Dead center in the plan of God. But he was having this emotional response. Yes, he was. He wasn't sitting, but he was having an emotional response. You're absolutely right. So relax for a minute and think about the times you've had emotional responses, but have been able to pull it together and keep going forward. Think about that. It's important to understand, especially in this series we're on. Notice now in Matthew 26, 37 through 40, the verses we're studying, really, we're focusing on Matthew 26, 37, 40. Jesus Christ played, prayed alone, wanted to be alone. We looked at privacy and downtime. Christ wanted to be alone in his humanity to pray. He didn't pray in his deity. God doesn't have to pray like that. It's his humanity. And the point is that you as a believer can handle your problems before God by taking every problem and putting them into the Lord's hand. Now you have to do that in a specific fashion. I'm going to say that again. Jesus Christ prayed in his humanity, not his deity. And the point is that you as a believer can handle your problems before God by taking every problem and putting them into the Lord's hands. But you have to do it in proper fashion with the right mentality. You're going to see what I'm saying. Jesus Christ faced the greatest pressure any member of the human race has ever faced. There's no doubt about it. His, he faced the emotional and really physical pressure just before his arrest, and he stood up to the test of that pressure. He stood up. That pressure came upon him, and even you're know, watching him, he had his knees buckled, he thrust himself down, he started to pray. You're going to see him sweat blood. He's having all these emotional responses, yet he's not sinning, and he passed the test of pressure wonderfully. Before he was taken in custody, he was ready to go. And he did it alone. Think about it. Everybody else went to sleep. He went by himself. And no matter what was going on, most people that were involved with our Lord scattered away. They might have watched from a distance, but he was alone. All by himself. We'll see that as this message goes on. We get deeper into Matthew 26, 27. Jesus Christ successfully removed the normal pattern of human emotions taking over his life related to what? Sorrow, betrayal, pain, and temptation when he lived by that which he preached. Man shall not what? Live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, every word written related to what? Bible doctrine. I'm going to leave that up there. I want you to think about this because I'm going to emphasize something today that prayer isn't what you run to, scream, help, get me out of this. Notice God, his prayer. We're going to be looking at this deeper, and I want you to pay attention because that gets a lot of people in trouble. They think prayer is their go-to problem-solving device. It is not. Jesus Christ successfully removed the normal pattern of emotions taking over his life related to the sorrow, the buildup of all these things, betrayal, pain, temptation, when he lived by that which he preached. Do you live by that which you talk about? Well, I believe in Jesus Christ. I study the Bible. Well, you're kind of preaching. Do you live by it? Or are you, oh, there's a problem. God, get me out of this. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word written related to the mind of Christ, Bible doctrine. This is important to understand, folks. I'm going to make some points today that are going to clear up what prayer should be used for. We might end up even going into a series on some problem-solving devices. Many of you know them. If you've heard Colonel R.B. Theme Jr. or the man who ordained me, Pastor Bob, they're wonderful to use, but we need to understand. You don't have to put all kinds of labels on them, but you need to understand. Prayer is not your go-to to run and say, God, get me out of this. 
It is not. Jesus did not do that. He said, whatever your will is, if this can pass me by, that's fine. If not, I'm going through it. While physical food is necessary for your life, and it is, it's a detail of life. You need it, but it's really a detail of life. It is Bible doctrine that counts in the end. In the end, all else fails when everything's going on around you. In the end, it is the Bible doctrine you have in here that you've fully digested, that you can turn into wisdom that's going to count. It was doctrine that sustained Jesus before and then upon the cross during those long-suffering hours. Before and then upon the cross, it was doctrine resident in the soul the humanity of Christ had. The thing that Jesus kept going was Bible doctrine, constantly. The truth of the word is what brought him to solve problems. It wasn't, Father, get me out of this jam in my humanity, I can't do this or whatever. Jesus was applying the word and then using, pay attention here, Jesus was applying the word and then using prayer to maintain the Father's plan with accuracy. Notice what he's doing. His prayer is related to, let me stay on course with your plan. If your plan can take me out of this, that's fine. If your plan brings me through it, let me stay on course. That's what the prayer was used for. What do I talk about? That journey, staying dead center in the plan of God. That's what your prayer is for. Jesus was applying the word and then using prayer to maintain the Father's plan with accuracy. Prayer by itself is not a problem-solving device. Prayer by itself is not a problem-solving device. If you are not a positive believer, listen to me carefully, applying Bible doctrine to your life habitually, prayer itself will be a weak source of comfort and guidance. I know a lot of people don't want to hear that. They just don't. And I know there's pulpits that might not teach it that way. I want you to understand this today. Prayer by itself is not a problem-solving device because what I'm talking about, and I think many of you know, is that prayer when things don't go your way. God, take care of this for me. God, get me out of this. God, do this for me because I don't want to go through this. That Be very careful of that. You're trying to use it as a problem-solving device. It's really not by itself. If you're not a positive believer, applying Bible doctrine to your life, prayer itself will be a very weak source of comfort and guidance for you. Sorry to tell you. And maybe... That's a wake-up call for some people, and they're going to realize, well, now I understand. I'm not really into the Word that much. I, I, I sporadically study the Bible. I don't, apply too, uh, I don't apply too many principles. But when things go really bad in my life, I'm quick to pray, God, help get me out of this. And He doesn't. He doesn't listen to me. Maybe there's something else going on behind the surface that is related to your journey and your love affair with Jesus Christ. Turn to Luke chapter 4, royal family. Luke Chapter 4. Matthew 4 and Luke 4 tell the same story. We're going to look at it from the angle of Luke because I've already studied Matthew chapter 4 before. But I'm going to show you some things and how Jesus applied when his emotions, he's physically and mentally drained. And we've all been there. Most believers and many pastors or spiritual gurus, whatever you want to call them today, rely on prayer to get them out of every negative situation in life. Let me say that again. Most believers, many pastors, and spiritual gurus as well, rely on prayer to get them out of every negative situation in life. You always hand things over to God, but there is something you have to be applying in your life as well. So understand that. Don't, every time a negative situation comes out, that's your go-to. God help, get me out of it. The, the Bible does not display prayer as your first defense against attacks or problem solving. You're always talking to God. You're always saying, God, this problem looks like overwhelming. Can you help me here? Show me what I need to do. Let me know what your plan shows. I want to stay in your plan. I want to go forward in your plan. That's a better prayer than help get me out of this. Give me the strength and give me the discernment to get through this. Because let me tell you something. If you haven't built up Bible doctrine over a period of time, your, discern your discernment is not going to be strong enough to evaluate your problems. That's a big issue. Prayer can only become a complement to the believer's skill set for problem solving after that believer has gained some spiritual momentum and has begun to move toward maturity. Let me say that again and digest this. Prayer can only become a complement 
to the believer's skill set for problem solving after that believer has gained some spiritual momentum and has begun to move toward maturity. Now, I never put God in a box. I tell you that all the time. There are times you can cry out, God help me, and all of a sudden he does get you out of it. I would tell you more often than not, if you're not a maturing believer, understanding what's going on around you and applying his word and living in the wisdom of the word of God, you are going to be a confused person when you do cry out that help prayer. He might not come through, and it's not that he's not coming through. You've made no grounds to understand what's going on around you. You've gained no momentum. It's important to understand, folks. Prayer is a complement to your problem-solving skills that you get from growing up. Crying out for God to rescue or remove every obstacle is a desperate ploy, really, of an immature believer. And I, like I said, you know, am I your enemy for telling you the truth? This might either wake some people up, which is a good thing, or get some people angry, which means they're being subjective instead of objective. Crying out for God to rescue or remove every obstacle is the desperate ploy of an immature believer. The obstacles are usually set there for your spiritual growth or testing. So why are you crying out when God already said eternity past, hey, I'm going to put those 10 obstacles in front of you over the next 10 years. They're going to pop up one at a time here and there. And I'm going to see you grow and apply my word and go through these things. And you're crying, take them out of my way. Give me everything perfect. That's an immature believer. Spiritual discernment, understanding the layout in front of you, what's going on around you. Spiritual discernment gained after a period of serious growth will give the believer a greater skill set toward problem solving and standing firm, which a lot of times you have to do in the face of adversity. That's one of the first things you want to learn to do. Stand strong. Stand firm. Just be like, all right, wait a minute. God's in control. I'm his child. I'm a bride of Christ. Let me think with doctrine. Let me stand firm. Let me not get all wavery and run away, cower behind something. Help, God, help me. Stand firm. Do you do that? But spiritual discernment gained after a period of serious growth will give the believer a greater skill set towards solving problems and standing firm in the face of adversity. You first need to know what's happening around you, folks. You can't just you know, panic. You first need to know what's happening around you before you run for cover and cry for help. Be careful of running for cover and crying for help every time. Do you know what's going on around you spiritually? Can you understand what's happening around you spiritually? When you have enough doctrine, you're going to be able to get around unbelievers or, or people with arrogance or pride or different things. And you're going to see without judging them the, the, lay, the lay of the land, what's going on around you, the people and environments, and you're gonna, your discernment's going to say, oh, I can see. I know what's going to happen here. I know how this is going to turn out. I know what direction I'm going in. I know exactly how I'm going to handle this person or this situation with Bible doctrine. Not just losing your emotions and losing your cool. The deeper your relationship gets with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the closer you get to seeing God the Father's plan for your life. That's what you really want. That's called real discernment. The deeper your relationship gets with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh. The deeper your relationship gets with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the closer you get to seeing God the Father's plan in your life all around you. Then you get to a deeper understanding of circumstances and people all around you. Prayer properly blended into the challenges and adversities of life then has a greater purpose and strength because now you're mature enough to know what's going on around you. So then prayer properly blended in there like a compliment. He compliments these things. Prayer properly blended into the challenges and adversities of life then has greater purpose and strength for you. Pick it up in Luke 4, 1. Obviously, many of you know when our Lord was alone, Matthew chapter 4 and Luke 4 cover this, and Satan was tormenting his humanity through that period of time. Many of you know this story, but then you have to think about the humanity of Christ because how does it start off? Luke 4, 1. Now, Jesus, humanity, 
being challenged by the devil himself. Think about that. Now Jesus, what? Walking in his flesh and thinking about the world? No. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Filling power. What do we have in the church age? He's our example. Returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. He's on the right track. Humanity of Christ. Jesus' humanity is being led by God the Holy Spirit, which means he's directly in the plan of God the Father. His journey on earth is directly centered in God the Father's plan. He's not wavering all over the place. He's right where he needs to be, so he's prepared. His discernment is laser sharp. Why do pulpits and people seem to believe that when you are following the plan of God, no adversity or problems will arise in your life? Lots of name it and claim it preachers out there that just love the Lord, the Lord loves you, tomorrow when your bank account is full, mail me a thousand and there'll be a thousand dollars mailed back to you because the Lord will come through for you. Why do pulpits and people seem to believe that when you are following the plan of God, no adversity or problems will arise in your life? Where is that? Show me where in scripture that every time we follow the plan of God, we miraculously have a perfect unobstructed path in front of us. I can show you there are times, absolutely, if you're in the plan of God, he's blessing and protecting you, all those things. But show me in scripture that every time you're following the plan of God and you're moving forward in his plan, that you miraculously have this perfect path in front of you with no obstructions in front of it, no stumbling blocks, no problems. We're all guilty of thinking along these lines from time to time. So don't worry about it. We're all guilty of this. I do it as well. Believe me, the last couple of months I was in that camper, I was starting to run out of a little bit of my faith fuel. I was struggling. Finances were getting tough. I'm wondering when it's going to be built. Certain things weren't going the right way. I felt like attacks were coming left and right. And I know some were, but God carried me through. Luke 4, 2. So we all fail in these areas. Relax. Take a breath. We're all human. We're all guilty of thinking these things. Luke 4, 2. For the 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he was hungry. So when you really read this in the original context, for those 40 days being tempted by the devil, this meant day in, day out, from all accounts, if you really tear it apart in the original context, that he was tormented the whole 40 days. He would be having a day and all of a sudden the devil would just appear behind a rock and start tempting him and then go away and come back the next day and do the same thing over and over again. Jesus is led into a 40-day fast. Now, fasting is good. It doesn't bring you salvation and all these other things. Fasting is good to cleanse your system, but really in spirituality in the church age, fasting really means removing all the garbage from your life. There's a lot more to that. I've taught that principle. We're not going to get into it today. But Jesus is led into 40-day fast, alone in the wilderness. Also a consistent temptation from Satan that we only see the tail end of, really. We get a sense of the different things he might have said, and certainly the tail end of it. But we don't get the full day-in, day-out description of every, every day, 40 days. A long time, 24 hours in a day, 40 of them. We have no idea how much misery and temptation Satan was allowed to put upon the humanity of Christ. Temptation and misery on the humanity of Christ. You'll notice from what we can read in Luke 4 and Matthew 4, Jesus Christ didn't tap into his deity. This is his humanity. At the end of the 40 days, we get a small glimpse of Satan's closing argument. Satan's closing attack on our Lord. Luke 4, 3. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. I know you're hungry. That's what I like to attack. When you're tired and hungry, believer, Satan likes to come get you when you're tired and hungry. He knows when. If, Luke 4, 3, if, if you are the son of God, if is in the Greek first class condition because I know you are the son of God. Satan's no fool. 
I know you are the Son of God. Now we see how the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his humanity began to solve this problem, exhausted, hungry, and beaten down, and adversity right in front of him, the devil himself. Luke 4.4, 4. and Jesus cried out, God, Father, get, get me away from this. Well, let me use my deity and knock Satan on his butt. Nope. How did he handle it? Luke 4.4, 4, Jesus answered to him, it is written, word of God, man shall not live on bread alone. What is Jesus doing? Filled with the Spirit, directly in God's plan, doing the right thing in the right way, applying the word of God, wisdom. Jesus goes directly into his own mind, the Bible, the word of God, to stand firm against the attacks. That's really what he's doing. You don't see him really go on offense. You could say this is a little bit of offensive. He's standing firm in the doctrine he has, which if you notice, Satan subtly is manipulating words. What's he famous for? Subtle manipulation. His subtle attacks are much more tricky, folks. But how does the Lord fight back? How does the Lord stand firm? The word of God, his own mind. Deuteronomy 8.3 and he humbled you, God humbled you and let you go hungry, talking about the Exodus generation, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, because they were stubborn, in order to make you understand that man shall not live on bread alone, but man shall live on everything that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. In other words, that manna was an analogy, analogous Analogy, <laughs> analogous to, uh, I get excited, I'm preaching. Analogous to God feeding us. And God feeds us the word. It's God's word that feeds us and keeps us going. Luke 4, 5. And he, Satan, Luke 4, 5. Get back to Luke 4, 5. He, Satan, led him, Jesus, up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Notice who's leading who. Jesus is still being led by the Spirit. So you mean to say this was part of the plan of God? Yep. Where's the easy path where Jesus could have began? Because this is early in his ministry, beginning of his ministry. We could have cleansed himself with this fast and just been alone with his father and figured everything out. Where's the easy path? Notice who's leading who. Satan, with the power and authority God gave him, is lifting the humanity of Christ up so high to a position that Jesus could look out and see cities and towns across the, across the land. It's almost like you get a sense in how this is written that it's almost supernatural how he's lifted up and sees all these kingdoms or cities and towns. And what, is, what does Satan say to him? And the devil said to him, I will give you, I will give you, I will give you all this domain and its glory for it has been handed over to me. And I give it to whomever I want. I can bless and reward whoever I want, says Satan, the God of this world. Satan's not lying. He knows he can't trick Jesus Christ. Satan's not lying. This is a statement of fact. In this temporal world, God has allowed Satan to reap a huge amount of authority over the earth. How did he reap it? He had a victory. Where did Satan have a victory? We have the victory. We absolutely do. Satan had a little battle victory. We win the war. Jesus Christ wins the war. But Satan's victory over mankind in the garden enabled him to have this great authority. Ephesians 2.2, 2, the apostle Paul calls him the prince and power of the atmosphere. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the apostle Paul calls him the God of this world. John calls Satan the ruler of the world in John 12, 31. He says the same thing in John 14, 30, the ruler of the world. And again, in chapter, what, 16, verse 11, he calls Satan the ruler of the world again. So the apostles know, Jesus knows his power, his authority in time, temporal. Why isn't the path in front of me just so easy? I'm a believer. I'm doing the right thing. I don't know. Does this look easy to you? He's our role model. Luke 4, 7. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall be yours. I have the power to give it. 
You show worship to God or Satan, either or, with your time, talent, and treasure, royal family, and your commitment to one or the other. God's plan or the cosmic system, Satan's world, one or the other. Time, talent, treasure, treasure, and the commitment. Commitment means you're putting yourself into something. You've committed and you're going forward knee deep in it, not giving up and quitting. Those unbelievers and really the negative believers also who reject the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and live for self, live for the cosmic system, indulge in all the lies and counterfeits, they get certain temporal rewards or blessings from Satan right now in time. I'd be a liar to tell you different. Those who reject the truth of the mind of Christ, even believers that go south on our Lord after salvation, Satan will give them little trinkets along the way. He'll give them little blessings and rewards. Don't think he won't. Luke 4, 8, Jesus replied to him. What is Jesus doing? Again, in the spirit, applying the word, two power options. Jesus replied to him, it is written, standing firm in my mind, in my word, you shall worship the Lord your God and God serve him only. Serve him only. Luke 4, 9, and he brought him into Jerusalem, Satan, and he had Jesus stand on the pinnacle, verse 4, of the temple and said to him, if, and I know you are, the son of God, you are the son of God. Throw yourself down over here. Well, how far is it going to drop? 20 feet, 30 feet? No. This is believed by all theological uh, teachings to be the porch area built by Herod the Great about 450 feet up. 450 foot drop overlooking the valley of Kidron. What Satan is challenging Jesus to do is something completely outside the plan of God the Father. Go ahead and use that deity against me. Go ahead, I know. I know you can do this, I know you can do that, because if you are the Son of God, and I know you are, do this, 450 feet. Throw yourself to your death. Let's see what happens. Tempting him. Jesus, exhausted and hungry in his humanity, beaten down physically and mentally, probably. Luke 4.10 for it is written, who's saying this? Satan. He will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you, verse 11, and on their hands, they will lift you up so that you do not strike your foot against the stone. Satan's absolutely right. How sharp is he? Psalms 91, 11, and 12. Satan, speaking directly, perfectly from Psalms 91, 11, and 12. Satan knows his scripture, amen? Be careful. He's a genius. This is why believers need to be prepared and spiritually mature. You're dealing with a genius. Does his arrogance make him look stupid? Yes, but don't think he's a fool. He is not. He knows his scripture. He's a genius. Very tricky, very subtle. So you better be prepared. Luke 4, 12. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been stated again, what is Jesus doing? You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus responds with scripture, Deuteronomy 6, 16. You want to throw Psalms 91? I'm going to throw Deuteronomy 6 on top of you. Notice what they're doing. Satan realized I can't get him to do these things. So let me use some of his own mind, his own words against him. And Jesus just stands strong. Deuteronomy 6, 16. You shall not put your Lord your God to the test. Luke 4, 13. And so, when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. That's the New American Standard I usually use. That's a really a nice way to say it. Until an opportune I know the different versions say it different ways. An opportune time. Because that lets you know he is coming back. This speaks to a certain time limit. Kairos is the word you're looking at. That term for opportune times. Kairos. Related to a time period or a season. What happens with a season? You know it's going to end and it's going to start another season and it's going to come back around again. Kairos 
is one of those Greek nouns we use for dispensations as well. What is a dispensation? It has a beginning or an end. Just think about that. Just letting you know. This means it will come to an end, a specific time frame. Satan never fully stops attacking, tempting and counterfeiting. He simply what? He slips away for a season after he fails. And then he comes back for another season, another time. That's really what it means. Interesting, isn't it? Well, Jesus passed the test and never be bothered again. No, that just lets you know Satan's going to come back around. Yeah, you passed the test. Satan and his army are like a vicious badger, for lack of a better description. They're like, what is it? The, I think it's the hyenas when I watch the Wild Animal Channel. They're unbelievable. They're bold. They'll just keep coming back around in a pack. Hyenas, if you watch them, when they see an animal's hurt, they'll keep coming back and just run in and attack and bite. And they'll even do it to a hurt. If a lion's even hurt, and they're afraid of lions, but if it's hurt, they'll keep coming back around. They'll follow that lion or that animal that's hurt for two or three days and keep circling around. Satan and his army are like a vicious bunch of badgers or hyenas who continually come back for another round of attacks. Yeah, you get breaks in between. Jesus now, in the Garden of Gethsemane, is feeling certain emotions that we've been studying, just as I'm sure he did during that 40 days of temptation. Certain emotions were going on. I guarantee it. Yet he had control. He never got outside of the plan of God. He stayed led by the Spirit and kept using the Word. Jesus Christ is sorrowful. He's very heavy as we've described, which means he doesn't want to go to the cross in his humanity. Can you blame him? He wants to avoid that pain and the judgment for the sins of mankind. He knows what's coming. Yet he hasn't committed any sin. He hasn't committed any sin. He hasn't turned down the plan of God the Father. He hasn't screamed running. He hasn't said, get me out of this. He hasn't been fearful. He hasn't turned down the plan. This is merely a natural first response or attitude that is human. It's normal. Be a fool not to feel, let me get out of this, but I'm not running. I'm just asking the Father, is any way <laughs> you can let this pass me by? That's fine, but I know your will has got to be done, not mine. That's important to understand that prayer. Matthew 26, 37 and 40, the reason this is recorded is to remind us several things. But one of the main things, what is that cost, Jesus Christ, going to the cross? What is that cost he paid? Do you realize the heaviness of that situation? It really opens our eyes to that. The humanity of Christ. In his humanity, he wanted to say, let this be removed if it's your, in your power, Father. Let this pass me by if it's, uh, if it's in part of your plan. But if it's not your plan, I gotta stay in your plan. The cross was dependent upon human volition. Human volition of who? Jesus Christ, not his deity. Not his deity. Were it not for the fact that there is free will, folks, on the earth, there'd be no salvation. Free will is all around. I don't care who teaches you different. We have free will. Jesus and his humanity had free will. This is also left as an example what we're seeing, as I'm telling you, for all believers to recognize physical and mental challenges and really how to handle them. There's a lot of reasons this has shown the humanity of Christ and this prayer and this situation where it looks like he's falling apart and he's not. There's a lot of reasons it's put there for us, folks. Please take a note on this. Our example. Matthew 26, 38, Jesus says to what? Peter, James, and John, my soul is heavy. It's kind of what he's saying. My humanity is feeling deep sorrow. The humanity of Christ felt the coming death and separation that would occur on the cross. He's starting to feel that weight of that. That's why he said, I feel almost close to death because it's coming. Human emotions related to sorrow, pain, hurt, Betrayal, as well as love and appreciation, we know there's a list of human emotions, are all part of the human experience. That's what I'm telling you. It is what that emotion is allowed to do, folks, or control that becomes the problem. 
It is, a, it is what that emotion is allowed to do. How much room, how much leash are you giving that emotion? How far is the leash going? Or are you just unclipping the leash and letting that emotion like a wild animal run free? Is there control? This becomes the problem area. We need to understand these things. That's why you first acknowledge some of your areas that emotions get the best of you. You acknowledge what they are. You acknowledge the good, the bad, and the ugly. Then you start to understand your own self in all of these things. Evaluate your own self. And then you can, you're can you able to apply and move forward in God's plan without it tripping you up all the time. Occasionally it will get the best of you. We're only human. Giving everything over to God in times of trouble. Very wise. I'm not telling you not to do that. Please understand that. But it will yield very little strength. You're not going to get a lot of strength from it if you do not have Bible doctrine to stand upon and then keep moving forward. Because what happens when it's a bad situation and you decided to neglect Bible study for nine months or a year or six months or whatever, but you're a believer, and all of a sudden the you-know-what hits the fan, and the first thing you do, well, Father, help me, please get me out of this jam. And the day goes by, the next day goes by, and you still got that jam you're in that's coming at you. What do you do? Most people would say, well, you're not listening to me. And God say, no, you didn't listen to me. I gave you a message three months ago from your pastor teacher, but you weren't there. You could have applied and maybe grown and learned some things. Giving everything over to God in times of trouble, very wise. We all should do that. But it will yield very little strength if you do not have Bible doctrine to stand upon and move forward in. If prayer is your only solution against an adversity, it means one of two things. If prayer is your only solution against adversity, it means one of two things. First and foremost, you're an immature believer. If that's your go-to problem-solving device, help get me out of this. Or, secondly, you have applied God's word to the best of your ability, meaning you're a maturing believer, and you discern your situation correctly, and you know it is time to watch the power of the Lord bring that victory home. You've gone as far as you can, applying and moving forward in the, God of plan, uh, the plan of God and applying his word and staying strong and standing strong. And now you're feeling, even at that point, like it's a little overwhelming. Now you can stand back and say, God, I've done everything I can. If this is your will, show me what you need me to do next and just give it all over to him. Absolutely. But if, you are, if you're somebody that as soon as the you-know-what hits the fan... The scubala is the word you're looking for. You run to God and say, help get me out of this. It's a sign of immaturity. Or if you're doing that, it's probably a sign as a mature believer, you apply God's word to the best of your ability. You've moved forward. You're discerning your situation correctly. You know it's time to watch the power of the Lord bring the victory home and show you what to do and where to go and allow him to do his work. It's either or, folks. Whether we look at Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, David, Peter, Paul, John, the list goes on and on. They all stood their ground against attacks and adversity by living in and relying upon what? God's word and power of prayer. You have to have the word. Yeah, there's power of prayer, absolutely. But you have to have the word. And, the, and you have to be guided by God, the Holy Spirit. If you're not in tune, you're not going to understand what the heck is going on around you. Puts you in a really emotional state. Relying on God's word, the filling power, and the power of prayer. How it complements everything together for guidance. Jesus in his humanity stood his ground by the guidance of God, the Holy Spirit. He applied Bible doctrine to his life. And he relied upon the plan of God, the Father. His prayers were blended into the application of the word and the power of the spirit. His prayers, and they were done in an exact fashion. His prayers were blended into the application of the word and the power of the spirit. That's a potent blend because you're a mature believer. We have to learn these skills. You need to learn to apply them the right way, the right thing done in the right way, the right timing. And not always screaming, help, get me out of this. God might want you to be knee deep in it. I don't know. 
I thank you for your time. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for these messages. Take them out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.